Okay, so before I actually get to our guest co-host today, I want to take a moment to introduce my colleague who I've mentioned her name before, Christina Gartner, but I like to do this because she is still relatively new to NWC. I believe what, this is the end of week, is it six? Six, yes. Six? Six. Week six. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun, right? Yes, for okay, sure. Okay, I'm hoping you were going to say yes if you were having fun. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I love that, I love that, Christina. But since this is really one of your first opportunities um, to, to be introduced, introduced to this community, I want to give you also a proper introduction. So I'm going to take some time just to read your bio, and then I'm going to allow you to greet the audience, and then we'll introduce um, Starlet, and then we'll go from there. Christina brings to NWC years of experience in diversity, equity, and inclusion from higher education and theater arts lens. Her first professional gig in DEI was joining a theater for social change troupe in her college town, Springfield, Missouri. Here she used Augusto Bulls Theater of the Oppressed to challenge various organizations and their members to rethink their usual DEI training. Before NWC, Christina worked at the College of Lake County as a multicultural coordinator. At CLC, she provided DEI training to various departments on campus, created social justice initiatives for numerous student groups, and served as the bias education and support team's founder and lead. She also served on the equity committee for the Lake County Workforce Development Board. In addition to Christina's passion for using DEI to make lasting change within organizations, Christina is enthusiastic about increasing the representation of BIPOC in theater, television, and film. She has a significant acting and writing resume, initially cho choosing to tell stories that further humanize and nuance the BIPOC experience from an intersectional lens. Christina holds a Master of Science in Student Affairs and Higher Education. Her graduate research centered on the experiences of BIPOC students at predominantly white institutions. Christina was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and now resides outside of Chicago, Illinois. We're so glad to have you a part of the NWC team. And so thank you so much, Christina, for all of the great contributions you've brought to the organization so far. And I look forward to sharing this space with you today. Thank you. Likewise, I'm so happy to be here and so happy to be sharing this space as well. <laughs> Fantastic. So now I want to introduce Starlet. Starlet is um, a friend of NWC. We've actually been connected for quite some time now when we first discovered the work that she was doing with DEI Champions. And so we are excited to give her an opportunity to share more about that today. She is the founder of DEI Champions, a virtual community focused on providing resources for individuals new to the DEI space, allies of all communities and professionals across the globe seeking guidance and building equity and diverse workplaces. Before starting DEI Champions, she worked as an executive assistant in corporate America for over seven years and is now focused on people operations, finding innovative ways to implement DEI into every aspect of her current role and her personal life as she continues to grow and to learn. Starlet, thanks so much for being here with us today. We, we always say to our guest co-hosts that we feel valued, seen, and heard when people say yes to the invitation. And, and we're just glad that you're here. We want to give you a chance to welcome and greet this audience in your own way. Thank you, Dr. Nika. Thank you, Christina, and the entire NWC team for having me. I'm so excited to be here uh, and share my story with everybody. Um, and just to give everyone kind of an intro, so um, my name is Starlet. I typically go by Star. I'm born and raised in New York, so I'm a New Yorker through and through. I'm biracial, so I'm half Puerto Rican, half Black, and DEI is something that's really important to me. I, it's something that I implement in my personal life, and you know, I try to implement it at, in the workplace as well. So thank you. That is awesome. Thank you so much. And so I'm going to call you Star now that you've let us know that that's what you normally go by. So thank you. I appreciate when people are forthcoming with that information because I want to make sure I'm addressing people the way in which they prefer. So thank you so much. Um, so I want to start off with giving you an opportunity to tell more about your story. And, and obviously you've started this process um, in talking about the, you know, some of the identities that are a part of your life and how and the lens that you have and how you like to show up. But the DEI story is so important to us. So what do we not know about Star just by reading her bio and what's been shared so far? Share a little bit more deeply with us. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. So Growing up, I was always surrounded by my Puerto Rican family. So I was raised by my grandmother. 
And by, I didn't really know my biological father growing up. I had only met him a handful of times. And so I think to some extent that caused me to be confused about my identity growing up. Um, and with that, you know, I've, it became, I became very empathetic and hypersensitive to people who were not accepted in certain situations because I kind of always felt like an outsider or I felt different. And I didn't know exactly what that meant until I grew older. Um, but I think my DEI journey just stems from me wanting other people to feel comfortable being their whole selves in any situation that they're in and just wanting people to feel that they you know, shouldn't, feel, shouldn't be treated differently based on the color of their skin or who they are or what they wanna identify as. And so that's when my real DEI journey began because I was in that situation and I would never want someone else to feel that way. I love that. Yeah, thank you. Jump right in, Christina. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that, then our next question kind of stems from that. So you talked about um, having your a biracial identity, having your Puerto Rican heritage and your Black American heritage and um, what the experience of like that was growing up. But I was just wondering what was kind of the catalyst or the moment in which you recognized your biracial identity? I think it happened in high school. So growing up, I always had Hispanic friends and uh, Black friends, people who I felt comfortable around who looked like me. And so even though they were accepting to me, you know, because they were my friends and my peers and things like that, I always felt like I was playing kind of like a tug of war. So sometimes my Hispanic peers would say, make comments like, oh, you know, you're not Black because you don't do X, Y, Z. And then my Black peers would say things like, you're not that Hispanic or would label me as Mexican because they felt that every Hispanic was labeled as Mexican. So being in those situ really uncomfortable situations where I felt like I wasn't understood or ex fully accepted by either group was really aggravating. And I think that was the moment when I realized I don't have to fit in in either one of these groups, right? I think it's okay to identify as multiple things. And so, you know, it took a long time to feel comfortable with myself and accept the fact that I don't need to fit everyone's perspective of what they think a Hispanic person is or a Black person is. And I think that was when I realized, you know, I'm biracial and it's okay for me to relate to these different groups for completely different reasons. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you so much for sharing that star. And I think there's probably a lot of people in this audience that really, you know, your words are resonating. So um, we really value what you're sharing. Um, so I'm interested, is this part of what led you to want to start DEI Champions? Yes, um, there's a lot of other reasons why uh, sure, I just wanted sure. to start DEI Champion. So uh, like I mentioned, when I was growing up, I always got to pick who I, you know, sat with or, you know, which group I wanted to hang out with. And I think once I graduated college and started working in corporate America, it was kind of a slap in the face. And I was like, oh, wait, you know, I don't, I can't choose who I have these conversations with anymore. Now I'm sitting in rooms with people who don't look like me. Um, the majority of the people in this room don't look like me, right? So how am I gonna be able to be comfortable? How am I gonna be able to succeed if um, I'm not the majority anymore, I'm the minority? So that was one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to start DEI Champions was because I wanted to be in a position where I was giving people those opportunities to feel welcome, to feel included. Um, and I think even now, as I move into this talent operations or the recruiting space, I want to give people an opportunity to have um, situations or opportunities that they wouldn't normally have had I not been the person giving that to them. And I think that's something that takes a lot of empathy and understanding and a lot of um, self-awareness for you to realize that, you know, how can you use your privilege to make someone else's life easier or give them an opportunity? No, I love that. I'm looking at Sophie's note and they, the chat, um, one of our audience members here today, she's, she's relating very much. She said, I relate to that immensely, always feeling like not enough of one group, but not enough of, of the other. And so Sophie, I know that you're here with us today. If you would like to unmute yourself and, um, and just share a little bit more about that, we, we would love to, to bring you into the conversation. Sophie Bells, by the way, is out of the um, San Diego area. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, my name is Sophie. And yeah, just a little bit about my story. I was um, adopted from China um, by a single white mom. Um, so that in itself is an experience. But, um, you know, especially with the recent um, shootings um, last month, or two months ago, actually now, um, it kind of, I don't know, it, it sparked something in me and it kind of forced me to face what was happening and how I'm related to what's going on in this community. And because I was adopted from China and you know, I don't have any direct relatives who are Asian, they're all white. Um, I've never felt super tied to this community um, or close to them. I kind of just, and I was always someone who tried to disassociate from my racial identity because of just society um, and kind of feeling ashamed of who I was and not wanting to be labeled as Asian. Um, so that was something. And then with these recent attacks, I finally realized all of these things that I had been pushing down my entire life. Um, like being embarrassed about my eye size and just going back to the comments I made in the chat of not feeling like enough of one group and you know I'm not white but I also don't feel entirely a part of the Asian community um so kind of feeling in this limbo uh and people actually telling me like oh you're not Asian enough because you don't own chopsticks or something like that so <laughs> it's kind of just this uh, where do I fit? <laughs> where do I fit in? Um, so yeah. yeah. So Sophie, um, Christina's going to jump in in just a second with the next question, but I, I just wanted to, to stand in solidarity with you. And, and first, thank you. Thank you for um, your willingness to share your, your thoughts and, and your concerns and your feelings and your experience with this community. Um, you are valued here. We, we, we so appreciate your support of NWC and just want you to know that this is a, a place of, of safety for you. And, and again, just grateful for you sharing your voice. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, for sharing. Yes, thank you, Sophie. I definitely want to echo what Nika said. Um, and kind of to think about that and to think about Star, which you were saying earlier about um, kind of the collegiate environment that you were able to kind of curate for yourself and you were able to find um, space to, to that recognized all of your identities and the duality of your identities and the intersectionality of your identities. And then having that kind of stark transition when you entered um, into the corporate world of not having those spaces and it being more difficult to create them just because who do you create them with and what have you? Um, so I was I was wondering, especially as you um, talk about um, in your in your backstory about being a first generation college student, and I think oftentimes um, in the collegiate environment, there's these spaces that are create created by the by the university or the college for um, first generation students, for students of color um, that do give them that mentorship or and do the, do give them that community and that is directly tied to after college placement and what have you, but then those same first generation students of color enter into the workforce and they don't have that network and they don't necessarily have those those mentorship opportunities. And I was just wondering through your through your organization, through DEI Champions, um, how have you been able to kind of cur curate those environments for those same students that have now entered into the workforce? Yeah, so when I think of DEI Champions, I think of it as this external sort of support system for people who don't have that either at work or at home. And I think the goal is just to create this network of people who, you know, if you're just starting on your DEI journey or if you're 10 years into it, there are other people who you can speak to or ask questions to. I always never, I never want to make myself seem as, you know, the expert of everything because there's still so many things that I need to learn. And so when I created the DEI Champions, I wanted it to be sort of a support system for everybody that's on a DEI journey. Doesn't matter what stage you're in and you know if there's a question that I can't answer that maybe someone else in the DEI champions can answer so um, I share a variety of resources or like events um, and even some networking opportunities that, that I might see in my email or my inbox I have so many DEI newsletters that I've subscribed to for the purpose of wanting to share that information um, and I think sometimes there's so many DEI resources that it can become really overwhelming so I hope that everyone that's part of this community feels okay asking those specific questions that they might need. 
um, resource for. I haven't fully dived into the student um, or academia space. So I, most of the people that are part of it are just professionals that are either in senior leadership roles or just starting out in their career, but that's definitely on, on my list of goals. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I love that star. Um, and I love the fact that you brought humility into the conversation. You know, you, I, I'm using that word, but as you were talking about um, that, you know, you don't proclaim to have all the answers and to know everything and you like to make sure that you're showing up in that fashion so that people can feel this comfort of learning with each other and being okay with wherever they are on their own personal journey. And I think that's so important because um, we do bring to this conversation a different lens based upon what we each have individually been exposed to. And, and I, I, I do hear some sentiments every so often from people that are, are wanting to engage deeper, but they're reluctant because they fear that not knowing enough based upon the person on the other end who could be judging them, that that's going to create some type of strain or discomfort. So I think that humility is so important to this conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the space that you provide for people to, um, to be free to explore and deepen their learning through DEI champions, I think is just great. So walk us through the process of how someone gets engaged. What are those different, you know, points of, of opportunities and, and a little bit of a deeper dive into who you serve exactly. I know that you mentioned at a high level, it's a lot of professionals, but I want us to have a clear understanding of the DEI champions community. Yeah, so I start, so the community lives on Slack. Slack is a, um, a software program. It's kind of like a Skype or an AIM yeah. um, for anyone on the call who might not be familiar with it. And what I love about it the most is that there's channels that you can create. Um, and that's where I kind of try to organize all of these different DEI resources. And so on the website, there's a link where you can fill out a Google form if you wanna join. And a lot of times I'll just join other events, um, DEI events. So one of the biggest ones that I love is Jennifer Brown's um, Thursday DEI community calls. And that's kind of where I really built the DEI champions community because I realized that everyone on that call is just looking for resources or looking for a leader to kind of get them started in their DEI journey. Um, and so me being able to network and talking to people I always tell them, look, if you're interested in DEI, why don't you join DEI Champions? You can ask any questions that you like. Uh, I cover events, uh, recruiting tips, uh, all sorts of best practices. And so the majority of people that I've gotten to join have been professionals in the startup space and corporate America. I've had a variety of people either from who are like HR leaders, people leaders, um, recruiters. I have a lot of recruiters on DEI Champions as well. Not that many students yet. I'm trying to figure out a way to reach that audience. Um, and I think one of the biggest things I'm trying to do this year is build a presence on LinkedIn as well, because I realize a lot of these students and professionals are on LinkedIn and that's where they go for most of their resources. Um, so, it, you know, it's still sort of in a learn, I'm in a learning phase on how to market DEI champions, how to get people to join. And just to be completely transparent right now, we have about 90 people in the community. Thank you so much for, for giving that detail and just sharing with us how we can get involved. I think that you'll definitely have some new um, members into the community after the call today and us sharing it with our network. Um, and I wonder, um, based upon what you were talking about a little earlier um, and the, the resources that you were providing for um, your community in order for them to be champions of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, how did you first get your grounding when it came to stepping in to spaces that weren't necessarily inclusive or diverse? Like what, what resources or what um, initial skill sets did you um, add to your wheelhouse, so to speak, in order to feel comfortable entering into that space and creating, um, creating space for the diversity, diverse voices? Yeah, so, well, the first thing I wanna say is that is, really hard thing to do, right? It's yeah. the DEI journey is not easy. Um, and that's the first thing I wanna put out there is anyone who's considering going into this journey to really understand like this isn't gonna be easy, but I think that's what makes it worth it, right? Um, and I think that when I've worked in corporate America, I've pissed a lot of people off in trying to do anything related to diversity, equity, inclusion, or even trying to create a space for myself, you know, it was really challenging sometimes. and. It's not, 
you're not able to do that unless you're pissing someone off, right? And I think you have to get comfortable having those conversations with leaders. Um, and I think to some extent, I'm a little privileged and um, lucky because as an executive assistant who's been in that, working as one for what, almost seven years, eight years, I became really comfortable talking to executives and CEOs mm -hmm. and things like that. And so throughout my career, there's been a few times where I've sat them down and I've basically said, you know, your corporation or your organization is not, it's not that welcoming to everyone and it's really toxic. Um, and I think to some extent, I've sort of been a martyr, right? Mm -hmm. Because when an organization was really toxic for me and I noticed that it was harmful to my well-being, I would quit, but I wouldn't quit before I raise all of those concerns with the hopes that it would create a better environment for the next person. Um, and I think that's how I try to use my privilege because not everyone can just get up and quit a job or be able to make a career transition. That's a really hard thing to do. Um, and I'm always happy to be that person who will do that. So um, that's one of the ways in which I've tried to raise those concerns with DEI. And then even now in the workplace I'm in, I'm really lucky that I have mentors and supporters who uh, allow me to sort of lead DEI and partner with other people on how to create the best DEI programs for our workforce. So in that sense, I am really lucky. I don't think it's always that easy for everybody. Um, and I think uh, you really have to have a support system in order to get through. Thank you. Well, I definitely want to commend you for um, both having the courage to recognize your worth and being able to um, recognize when it that when it's time to to leave for your own well being and for the well being of being able to better those around you, but also recognizing your power, having proximity to those executives and your executive assistant role, and um, recognizing that you kind of have this um, side door into a way of really changing some policies and some some thoughts and procedures. So I, I really want to commend you for that for sure. Star. Thank you. Thank you. I also enjoy pissing people off when it's necessary. So <laughs> I love that. That, that comes with it. <laughs> That's part of that, um, that good trouble, right? Yeah, <laughs> yep. yeah no, that's awesome. Um, so what do you see as the, as the future? Where do you want to take DEI champions? What's the ultimate goal for it? And maybe you haven't I thought that far. <laughs> I haven't thought that far, but even if I think like off the top of my head, I want it to be a, just a global community that is giving people resources that they need to start any version of their DEI, um, program or um, any part of their journey. I, when I envision it, I think of it as just this huge networking community where people can just ask questions and get the answers that they want. And at the very minimum, maybe just have a support system or thought partners that they can communicate with at any time. What are the most prevalent challenges that you hear from, from those that are connected with DEI champions as they're navigating um, the, just the complexities of of um, the society right now, where there's so many social complex issues that continue to surface. What are some of the, yeah. the issues that are, continue to come up? I think the most common theme I've been hearing is how do I get my senior leadership to understand why this is important? Mm -hmm. um, which is a really hard question. And I think the answer is not black and white. Um, you have to really work through what the issues are, really figure out what the root cause of that problem is. And I think that looks different for every single company and every single organization. It's not gonna have, you know, each organization is not gonna have the same solution, right? It's not this, you know, simple, easy plan that you can just provide to everybody. So what I try to do is because I don't feel like I'm a huge expert on DEI, I just try to have um, video chats with them and just walk them through you know, what are the problems you're having? Where, where do you see yourself? Um, what role do you see yourself playing in this journey? And I think getting them to talk and think about things, they kind of create their own ideas. And a lot of the times they'll walk away from the conversation just saying, thank you so much for just having the conversation with me because I, I didn't have anyone in my organization to bounce ideas off of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the biggest things is that they're trying to start this on their own even though they might be an HR leader, you know, their CEO or um, any other key stakeholder might not be fully supportive of any DEI initiative. So I think they just want to have someone to listen to them, hear what they're going through and provide any sort of support to them. Mm -hmm. I would be interested to know that 
um, have the asks or just the conversation within the community, um, and I'm sure that they have, but how have you recognized that they have kind of shifted and changed throughout the past several months with everything that we've, um, you know, gone through as a society, everything that's taken place? How does, how does the conversation, how does people, how do the resources people are asking for, how do they kind of ebb and flow and how have you witnessed that take place? Yeah, so a lot of the time, sometimes they'll enjoy, they'll invite their team members to have a chat with me and we'll just have like a group brainstorming session and they'll get started with creating a community at work um, who of people who are interested in DEI, which I don't think they would have normally have done if, I think they knew they wanted to do it or it needed to happen, but they just needed someone to tell them this needs to happen and I validate, they basically just need their opinions and their suggestions and validated. Um, and I think that's what I try to provide. Like, yes, what you're thinking is correct. Um, X, Y, and Z is wrong. And um, this is what you should do to try to solve that. And because I don't work there, it's hard for me to really dive into um, what the best solutions are or what's really going on. So I really try to encourage them to find someone in their on their team or in their organization who they can partner with. And I always um, tell them, if you wanna have that conversation as a group, I'm happy to do that. But I think one of the biggest things that I've seen is that they just need that community space inside of their workplace to get things kickstarted. And that directly links to a question from Star and um, that's with us today. Um, how do you connect with business resource groups using your community? Yeah, so we actually have a resource groups channel and I try to share a bunch of resources there. I've also in my workplace, we, we just kicked off employee resource groups. So I'm on both sides of it. You know, I'm seeing people who are just starting out or seeing people who've already started employee resource groups. And I'm in a different situation where I'm in the middle of it at my current workplace. And so I can kind of see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and I think a lot of these organizations, they're really small, so they don't feel comfortable labeling it as business resource groups. I've noticed mm -hmm. that some senior leaders have weird, um, I don't want to say weird, but they have inclinations about like, what are we going to label this group as? So what I always tell them is just say, you know, community, you know, a leader mm -hmm. cannot tell you, you can't name your group a community because that's what it is. Um, so I try to just give them as much advice about their employee resource groups or business resource groups in how to start it, how to continue with it, check in with everyone that's in that group, you know, when things surface in the news or on social media, you know, my my main focus is always check in with those people because you, the leaders of your employee resource group also need support, right? Like it's not, it's not a one man team. It's not just one team's responsibility. It's a collective um, effort. So Star, what's coming up for you of late? Um, you know, as you think about this broad topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion, so much has occurred. So I always like to understand, like, what are some of those um, areas that, you know, our, our co-hosts are feeling really emboldened about, empowered around, and, and really are, are paying closer attention to? Is there anything in particular that's coming up for you? I think the biggest thing right now with everything going on is, um, there's a hard line between celebrating all of these multicultural holidays that come up each month, but then also actually checking in with those people, right? I think one of the biggest, one of the most important things is making sure that these employees have a space where they can vent to each other and they feel comfortable doing that. I think that goes a long way. And I think that sometimes resonates more with your workforce than, you know, highlighting a holiday or something like that. So even with everything that's going on, um, we have an employee resource group at work, which we call it um, Black at Cadre. And I've noticed that that group just really wants to vent to each other and talk about what's going on and things like that. So I think that's one of the biggest ways um, you can support your employees during these unprecedented times. Yeah, just a safe space for people to feel yeah. like they really can socialize how they're processing without feeling judged, you know, um, yeah. chained, guilted. Um, I love that. And I think that it has great value to organizations from a standpoint of deepening the relationships between, you know, coworkers and peers. And there's value to that. So um, I'm glad that you're, that you're finding a lot of passion and energy around creating those opportunities for the organization that you are a part of and also encouraging others to think about doing the same. 
um, <clears throat> I consider the fact that we are approaching um, the weekend for, for Mother's Day. And while there are a lot of people that are going to celebrate without thinking anything other than this is just a happy occasion, there could be a number of people that, you know, right now is a really hard time for them. Um, and it could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe someone is having issues with infertility. Maybe someone has, you know, they no longer have their mother here. Maybe there's a strange relationship, you know, with, with the mother. And so I, I just saw this as an opportunity to bring to light some of the things that we don't often consider that really those safe space conversations and just being able to name those things can, can be helpful, can be helpful. And so anyway, you just gave me a moment to kind of um, amplify that with this group. But thank you. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot, actually, because my so my grandmother raised me um, and I actually lost my mom when I was 15. So Mother's Day is is I'm always in between. Like, I'm really happy to celebrate my grandma. But yeah. it, sometimes, you know, some holidays are harder than others. Um, thinking about, you know, my mom, who I lost when I was 15. So I definitely understand that, too. Like even seeing all of the Happy Mother's Day posts on Instagram, sometimes I don't even open Instagram on Mother's Day because you know it's just too much so I definitely agree with what what you said yeah okay so I want to take a moment just to welcome the the Facebook audience that may be joining us because we are live on Facebook as well um, if you have questions certainly feel free to place them into the comments area and it will find its way into our chat here and I also want to remind those that are a part of this zoom community that you certainly can place your questions into the chat as well. Um, and we're going to give you a chance in just a moment to even unmute yourself if you feel so inclined to present your question directly that's one of the benefits of being back on zoom which again we transitioned to this back to this platform so we're super excited about it. But uh, Christina certainly take us into maybe the next conversation or topic that we that we want to address with them um, with star. Sure, so I would love to know that from your experience from um, the conversations that you've had with members of your community and when, and what you've learned from them, what advice would you give to um, the onlys um, in, in um, different working environments? Uh, and then I, I think that uh, Shana Rhymes uses the phrase first only different, like you're just <laughs> different from the, your first, your only are different, but I love that the idea of the only. What advice would you give to those people? Yeah, the first thing I wanna say is it's okay not to fit in. Um, I think naturally, we go into the survival mode when we're the onlys of a group to sort of try to blend in so that we feel accepted and by this other community. And so I just wanna tell everyone, first thing is it's okay to not fit in with everybody. It's okay to be different. It's okay to have different perspectives or be the only one who looks a certain way. That doesn't necessarily mean that this group will, won't accept you. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will accept you, right? Um, so I think going into it knowing that is okay. Um, and I think one of the biggest things too is you know, if a workplace, a person or a relationship or a group of friends, if it's harming your well-being in the sense that you don't feel understood, heard, respected because you are the only, um, then it's not, it's not worth it. I'm a huge advocate that if something no longer serves you, you should walk away from it. Now, I realize that sometimes that might be easier for other people to walk away from situations that aren't great for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in those instances, it's important to have a support system outside of that, right? So if it's happening at work, it's important for you to have a group of friends or family members who you can go to, who support you, who accept you for exactly for who you are. And I think right now, one of the biggest things too is therapy. I think that's such an underrated form of self-care, you know, and it's okay to go to therapy for something that's happening to you at work, something that's happening to you at home. Um, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, um, and I think that it's really important to, um, to consider that as well. Yeah. No, I love that you are bringing emphasis to the therapy portion and just self-care in general. That is so critical, especially for individuals that find themselves challenged with having to navigate all that comes with um, these intersecting identities that are seen as, as marginalized, you know, it's, it's really hard. So I appreciate you bringing that to the fore. And um, you're getting some appreciation in the chat as well. People saying thank you for, for talking about mental health. Um, you know, Brittany said something into the chat and I wanna highlight it. She said, as you were talking, she said, it's like going into survival mode that explains it perfectly. And what that looks like for each person can be different. 
Um, and Brittany, I don't know if you're at a place to where perhaps you would like to share a little bit more. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'll, I'll give you a moment or two to, to think about that. And if so, we're happy to unmute you. But but yeah, I mean, when you think about the, those words, feeling like you're always in survival mode, that in and of itself just should give each of us pause, you know, pause in yeah. a way to where we think, how fair is that? How, how complex is that? Um, and hopefully when we think about people having to feel like they're in survival mode day in and day out, that it makes us feel called to action around what can I do, you know, with my level of, of sphere of influence to be able to help create opportunities where people have a heightened level of safety, you know, and dwelling yeah. in, in environments where they should feel safe. Yeah, so. you can't take care of other people unless you take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. And I think that that survival mode can sometimes be in the form of us ignoring or suppressing those microaggressions that we might face mm -hmm. because we are the onlys and mm -hmm. that only ends up harming you in the long run right um, I think that is really taxing on your mental health yeah um, not only does it make you feel very lonely being the only but also it causes you to become if you're not careful insecure because your question do I belong here am I valued here do I have full opportunity for success and again, if someone is in that mind space, it's really hard for them to be able to show up as their best self, right? So I, I appreciate you you're bringing that up. For sure. And that kind of makes me think about um, what we were talking about is keeping the same analogy of survival mode, this idea of like fight or flight. Like, am I going to be here? And I'm going to, am I going to, as these micro questions come up, how am I going to feel the need to fight them every day and what the weight of that that um, leads on you or am I just going to leave the environment because it's it's weighed down on me so much and what does that look like so I think that that's a great analogy thank you for that Brittany yeah. you know what comes to mind for me as we're talking about this is I think there's also merit into noting that not everyone has the emotional capital to deal with um, environments that feel very toxic to them, that feel um, alienating to them. And, and I, I appreciate that being the truth, you know, for some individuals, you know, I think that sometimes part of this conversation, it causes us to think about, to be self-aware and to realize that if we find ourselves in that predicament, there is that option of kind of weathering the storm and trying to create the change we want to see in that environment. But at, then on the other end, it also, it brings someone to a place where they have to make the decision. Do I want to continue to subject myself to all that's so triggering for me? And, and can I handle that? And not everybody has that emotional capital. And so, you know, I've heard you say at the start, Star, that you, you're, you're very confident. And at this point, I'm sure that probably was a journey to get there, but you're very confident in being able to leverage your, your position with those clear relationships and accessibility to, to leaders, to be able to, to name those hard things. And, um, and then, you know, if the response is not what you deem to be something that you want to be a part of, then, then you, you, you okay with making that call to walk away, you know? And so anyway, I just wanted to have some dialogue around that. Cause that, I, I kept, that kept surfacing for me as we were having the last conversation. Yeah. Even, even in my personal life that actually happened multiple times where there were relationships that I needed to walk away from. Um, and I can give a specific example. I was dating someone a few years back who is someone of a different race and it was a four year relationship. And um, it wasn't until I was getting out of it that I realized the amount of microaggressions that I went through with this person's friend group, with this person themselves, um, was very, very like weighing on me so heavy that I actually started um, therapy uh, a year ago. And I realized that a lot of those instances that I went through at the time, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on. But, you know, as things start to build up for you, you realize like, you know, why am I so angry? Why do I always feel like I need to prove myself? Or why do I get so frustrated when people don't understand me? And I think a lot of that stems from a lot of those microaggressions that someone might be facing um, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And I don't think necessarily those people did it on purpose, um, but I think it comes with not being self-aware and not realizing that certain things you say to someone who's of a different race, how that might affect them in a different way. So, um, and I think now in the corporate world at work, I see it as a privilege um, that I can walk away from a job 
right? But that wasn't always necessarily the mindset I had in my personal life where I was willing to walk away from something that quickly. So I think being able to realize and figuring out, you know, understanding what your worth is and what your value is and understanding that nothing lasts forever. And if something doesn't serve you, you should walk away from it because it's going to harm you in the long run. Yeah, Vanessa puts into the chat that creating awareness is such an essential step. Thank you, Vanessa, for that. Because yes, that is that is solid. Um, so I want to go back to the fact that we are in Mental Health Awareness um, Month. And this is where I want to bring in the audience as well. I think that we're probably each are seeing a lot of things. Maybe we're experiencing them directly in our workplaces about how people are amplifying the message of self-care and mental health. Um, I want to know, what is this community seeing that is really resonating with you and that seems effective in getting people to normalize conversation around mental health? Um, and so if you are willing to share with us, I want to invite you to un unmute yourself and, um, and let us know. We would love to bring you on to be a part of this conversation. And Star, maybe you can start. What are, are you seeing anything right now that's kind of really resonating with you that companies are doing around, again, just helping people to, to normalize the fact that we have to take care of ourselves. And if that looks like um, therapy or whatever it is that we need to we need to see that as, as a necessity and not as, as something that we should be ashamed of. Yeah, I've noticed organizations are giving mental health days, um, which I think is really big, right? I don't think that, I think people, when they think of mental health, they think something bad or that something's wrong with them or that it's um, depression or anxiety, but you know, mental health can, you can take care of your mental health in any way, right? If there's a day that you need to take off from work and just, do something that makes you happy, that's totally fine. And I think it's important for organizations to normalize that by suggesting that employees do take mental health days. Um, and I think another big thing too is what kind of benefits are you providing when it comes to mental health, right? Like, you know, therapy can become really expensive for some mm -hmm. people. Not everyone has the same resources and things like that. So um, I think that's another Thing that I've seen where organizations are giving out um, free mental health services or they're partnering with other organizations who, who will provide discounted rates for, to, for their employees to see therapists and things like that, which I think is great. No, absolutely. So Vanessa um, placed something into the chat that resonated as well. I'm going to invite Vanessa Nazario to unmute and share some of what she's seeing that's resonating in terms of um, the mental health awareness. I think she may be searching for the, um, Natasha, can you help Vanessa to unmute, please? Yeah, no, it, it's, um, you can't unmute yourself. You need permission. <laughs> it's locked, <laughs> as I was trying. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for the opportunity just to share. So just with, uh, for spirit of transparency, I do work for our hospital system, so healthcare. So kind of keep that in mind in terms of the clinicians and physicians that have been at the forefront of everything that's been going on relative to the pandemic, right? So for us, it was so hypocritical to make sure that the messaging we sent out around raising awareness really, well, two things, right? Um, reducing stigma around the need to have, you know, someone to talk to, right? And, and access those tools that we have. Um, but then also that, you know, we're in it together as a team. So the message really focused on those two key sort of elements because um, there's such a stigma when you say mental health people automatically think oh boy what's going on is are they going to be ineffective at their job do is there you know cost to, right so we need to kind of remove all those stigmas so part of our messaging that we sent out corporate wide and that um the team is deploying is really around we got your back it's okay Here's some tools that we have, you know, for you to use. Um, and we try to make it very easy for them to access those tools in terms of you know, how we pointed them out in the messaging. Um, and there's actually a committee that meets uh, monthly around resiliency. Um, mm -hmm. and it's super hyper important for us, again, um, as caregivers. Um, we're so much, very much in it. We're so very much in it, right? The pandemic and, um, you know, nurses working extra overtime and, 
it's it's tough right you know so anyways i just wanted to share a little bit about what we're doing in our particular space to honor those that um you know really need um uh, an opportunity to, to disengage and, and you know connect with someone who can help you know kind of just have a sometimes it's just a conversation quite honestly right this is what it was going on with me and then they'll have dialogue get some tools and they're like all right i'm, ba I'm going back into it so but anyway thank you no, thank you for sharing. I think also it's important for us to communicate that, you know, as people are engaged in conversations where others are looking to support them, to, to find ways to communicate what, what support looks like for them. I think that's important too, because otherwise we could find where what we feel like is going to be um, supporting the individual could be creating some additional harm. And so how do we get people to feel comfortable kind of sharing that? Um, and so I, I'm loving what you're adding to the conversation, Vanessa, and thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, yeah. sorry, I just wanted to add, um, you know, we often say lean into our vulnerabilities when we're having these DEI conversations. And I think the same can be said about mental health. And I think um, one of the things I, my academic work focused on a lot was shame resiliency, um, the shame resilience um, theory by Brene Brown mm -hmm. and how we can cultivate spaces where people can be authentic and be themselves and talk about their issues without feeling ashamed. And one right. of the key things to that is being met with empathy. So I just wanted to bring that up into the space, how important that is. So thank you for bringing up mental health. No, I love that. Thank you so much, Mark, for contributing. So Mark is one of our teammates with NWC, DEI coordinator, um, definitely an asset, particularly around um, disability justice, accessibility. And I know that this mental health conversation is really important to you. So I appreciate you lending your voice to the conversation. Um, so Linroy had a comment that he made and it deals with resiliency and it's how do you see building resiliency. Um, and Linroar, I don't know if you want to come on and unmute yourself and share a little bit more related to your question, and then we can see if we can collectively try to provide um, some answers for you. I think maybe you were trying to unmute. Okay, I think we have the gist of your question. Who would like to who would like to take this? How do you see building resiliency? How can one build resiliency? Because that is also a part of solving for some of these complex issues that we're talking about. How do we build resiliency? Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is being getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think when we're in a comfort zone for too long, that it could limit us from building resiliency. And I think as I had mentioned before, I think one of the biggest things is when you are in those uncomfortable situations or um, whether it's at work or in your personal life, having something to fall back on, right? Whether it's going home and venting to your friends or your family or um, having someone at work who can just hear you out for a few minutes, I think that can help because I think it's hard to build resiliency if you don't, if you're not taking care of yourself as well. There has to be some sort of trade-off with that. No, I love that. Um, other thoughts on building resiliency. I, I always love to, again, crowdsource around these things because I believe we all can learn with and from each other. Are there any other thoughts that come to mind about building resiliency? If so, please feel free to unmute yourself and share or to place it into the chat. Yeah, so I'm seeing some good stuff into the chat. Josephine says, pushing through fear with courage to have the difficult conversations. Yes, absolutely. Because it becomes more commonplace for us not to wear. And I think that that lessens some of the anxiety um, and, and builds resilience, of course. And then Lynn Ward shares, work with a coach, um, a mentor, you know, be honest with yourself. I love that last part. Self-awareness is the first step, right? We have to realize that we do need to work on building up our resiliency. And so that's really good. And the Vanessa adds, removing the stigma around it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, I think I wanna try to go to a poll question now. And uh, my colleague Natasha is gonna get this up for us. But the question is simply, what kind of DEI resources um, do you, the community that's joined here today, find most useful? And we have a couple different efforts that are, or ideas and selection options that are placed here. What kind of DEI resources do you find most helpful? 
And Star, I think this may be a value to you as well, because I know that you curate a lot of content and resources for your DEI champions community. And so we'd love to get you to weigh in on what you're seeing maybe is um, resonating with, with those who are part of DEI champions. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is events and um, programming ideas. Yeah. Now, do you now right now COVID is going on? So I would imagine that from a DEI champions perspective, there's probably been um, maybe little few events, or are you starting back? Are you thinking about when to bring events back, or, or maybe you're having virtual events? So um, when I when I share events with them, I try to um, outsource those. So okay. it can be anything from like Jennifer Brown's community to intentional conversations that I'll say, you know, hey, this is a topic that's being covered. So if this is an area that you're interested in, you should join this event. So um, that's one of the things I do, but I would love to eventually start creating events for DEI champions. I'm not sure what that would look like yet, but it's something that I'm, I've been thinking about. No, yeah, that's great. You've mentioned the JBC community, Jennifer Brown, and um, Jennifer Brown's a great friend of NWC. In fact, she's going to be serving as our guest co-host um, in the weeks to come. If before my colleagues can recall what that date is and place it into the chat, we'd love for this community to, to mark that date and time on their calendars and, and to join us. Um, but yeah, so it looks like in the lead right now uh, is definitely events. And so you're, you're spot on. You're spot on with what you're, with the direction that you've been seeing so far and what you want to get back to. Yeah, I think especially now that we're virtual, people want to network. I think it's almost kind of easier to network now that we are virtual, right? I think stepping in, into a physical space with a bunch of people you don't know might be a little bit more intimidating than being able to join an event and having your camera off. Um, I think there's just something about that, especially for anyone who might be a little bit more introverted. Right, we love for the introverts. You have to make sure we aren't forgetting about the introverts. I think that they are appreciating what's happening right now. And maybe there could be some anxiety that's creeping in for them as they think about having to re-enter um, what was normal for us prior to the pandemic. And so again, you know, you never know when there's an opportunity to kind of hold space for someone and to consider their plight, their, their circumstances. So I always think it's important to, to let's make sure we're asking questions and we are um, getting to know people more than just the surface this level. Um, so we are getting close to the top of the hour. I want to bring my colleague Christina back in here to just kind of maybe socialize any thoughts that are coming up for her or parting remarks. And then we're going to give you, Star, the absolute final remarks as we as we close out today. But let me just say quickly, I thank each of you for joining us. And, and Star, I really appreciate you sharing your voice with us today. I appreciate your leadership particularly around the DEI champions and the space and the opportunities that you're providing for those that I'm sure are gaining great value from it. And we'll be sure to connect this community to those efforts. And thank so you. thank you for being here, Christina, and then Star. Yes, thank you. I thank you so much for everyone for being here today. Thank you so much, Star. I'm so happy to now be a part of your DEI community um, and that we now have now have each other as a part of our network. So thank you so much. This conversation has been fantastic. So I'll just pass it over to you. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for the, to the NWC team for inviting me. Um, I really enjoyed having this conversation. I would love to connect with everyone on LinkedIn. If they have any questions that they wanna ask me or if they wanna join DEI Champions, um, I would love to welcome those conversations. Awesome, have a great weekend everyone. And hopefully we'll see Thank you back you. here next Friday for an, another Intentional Conversations podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.